So the people who are in the sample population, but not the target population, might be um, those who are walking by me in front of the science center, but are not actually Wellesley students, right? Maybe they're Olin students or Babson students or MIT students or even um, faculty or staff or um, anybody who might be walking to the science center who I might mistake for a student, um, a Wellesley student who's not actually a Wellesley student. So your goal um, is when you're designing a study um, is partly to choose a sample population um, such that it is similar as possible to the target population, right? So one of the goals we have, again, is to choose a data collection method such that the sample population is as similar as possible to the target population. I want to get the right answer. So it'd be nice if my way of collecting data did not systematically exclude people who are not part of the target and also if it did not include people who are um, not um, part of the target. The next term we'll define is sample. The sample is the set of units for which you attempt to actually collect data. So set of units. So it's important to note here that there's some ambiguity in the next two terms we're going to define. They're sometimes used somewhat interchangeably. The set of units for which you attempt to collect data. And then I'm going to right now go ahead and define the next term, which is respondents. This is the set of units actually in your data set. So the warning I want to put on here is that there's ambiguity in these terms. And the word sample is often used, including by me, um, to describe the people, the units who act here in your data set. So in other words, the definition I just gave for respondents can be used as a definition for sample. So ambiguity sample can be, um, that word sample can be used to describe units actually in your data set. But why do I have two separate terms that people, the units that you attempt to collect data on and then the respondents who you actually collect data on? Well, that's because in many cases, those things will be different, right? You'll have the sample population of all the people who are walking by um, the table that you set up in front of the science center. You'll attempt to reach some of those people, like as lots of people are walking by, you'll reach out to a few and say, hey, will you be in my study? Will you be in my study? And some of those people say yes, and some of those people say no. There are, there's more than one way at that moment that things could possibly go wrong, right? Which is what we're talking about right now as we go forward. Um, I may not be reaching out to a representative set of the people who are walking by. And in addition to that, once I do reach out to people, the ones who say yes may not be representative. So I find it useful in many situations to distinguish between the sample, the units that you attempt to collect data on, and the respondents, the one who actually participate. But again, I'm saying it again because it's important. Um, Sometimes this, this response definition is not part of the framing and sample is directly the label for the units that are actually in your data set. If you think about our example of trying to learn about the average uh, U.S. household income where the target population is all U.S. households, the sample population might be all the households that have phone numbers on a certain list. Maybe I'm going to look at that list, choose in a certain way some of those phone numbers to call. So now the set of phone numbers I'm going to call is my sample. Once I call and say, hey, would you like to participate in my study? Some of them will say yes, some of them will say no. The ones who say yes are my respondents. One of the times when these terms become a little bit less clear is if I post a survey online. So suppose you come up with a, um, suppose you come up with a link and maybe you actually email it out to all Wellesley students if you're interested in Wellesley students. So maybe your sample population is your target population because you sent an email to every single Wellesley student. Um, so, okay, but then the people who actually respond, is that your sample or your respondents? Uh, you, could, you could actually, argue either way. You could say, well, um, the sample population is everybody who received the email and therefore the sample are the ones who, who responded to it. Or you could say that the um, sample is actually the same as the sample population because I attempted to collect data on everyone and the respondents are the ones who actually wrote back. 
It's even more confusing if you just post a link on Facebook. Um, so just to think about these terms, it is important to take them to, to figure out how you're framing a particular situation. But the reason it's important is that we're going to try to figure out how the units that are actually in our study may or may not differ from the target population. And the particular labels you put on each of these steps is, are, are less important than your understanding of how the um, how representativeness might change as you go through these steps. Let me go back to the picture that I had here. Let me add to it. So I'm going to choose another color, I'll choose green. By definition, by definition, my sample has to be part of my sample population. Because my sample population is the set of all units that have some chance of ending up in my study. And so my sample has to be a subset of the units that had some chance of ending up in my study. But note that it is totally possible that your sample will end up including people who are not in the target, right? I might reach out to people walking by me in front of the Science Center who are not actually Wellesley students. And then your respondents are a subset of the sample. These are the respondents. Okay. All right. So that's what this looks like. Now, why do we care about this? Well, the reason we care about this um, is that we're concerned about how the respondents may be different from the target population. Okay. So when we're designing a study, at each of these stages, we have some control. Like we choose a data collection method. So we should be trying to choose a, a data collection method that makes a sample population as similar as possible to the target population. We choose a data collection method. So we should be choosing a way that makes the sample as representative of pos as possible of the sample population. And when we're designing our study, we should choose it such that um, a high, the respondents, the respondents should be as similar as possible to the sample. Um, one way to think about that is we want a high response rate um, but even more importantly, the respondents have to be similar to the sample. So the question I want you to think about right now is, um, at which of these stages do we have the most control, usually? At which of these stages do we have the most control um, over, over um, defining the, the set of units? So is it choosing the target at all, choosing the sample population, choosing the sample from the sample population, choosing the respondents from the sample? What do we have the most control over? Mm 